Welcome to this educational video put together by ESIT Juniors. Today we will discuss Common Variable Immunodeficiency, or CVID for short. CVID is the most common symptomatic primary antibody deficiency in humans. The acronym CVID was coined in 1971 by the World Health Organization to distinguish non-defined antibody deficiency conditions from syndromes of known Mendelian inheritance that are associated with low immunoglobulins. Nowadays, CVID is considered an umbrella diagnosis, which includes a heterogeneous group of disorders characterized by hypogammaglobulinemia, failure of specific antibody responses, and a resultant increased susceptibility to bacterial infections, particularly of the respiratory and gastrointestinal tract. At least one third of patients present with autoimmune manifestations or inflammatory conditions, for example, interstitial lung disease or enteropathy. Lymphoproliferative disease and lymphoma are also more prevalent in this population. Now let's go to the exam room and meet our patient. A 33-year-old man presented with recurrent respiratory infections from the age of 10, including two episodes of pneumonia and multiple bouts of sinusitis. Infections were usually treated with antibiotics at home. His past medical history was significant for one episode of idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura at 16 years of age. During the previous months, he reported progressive worsening dyspnea, fever, and lymphadenopathy. His symptoms failed to respond to several courses of antibiotics prescribed by his primary care physician. Physical examination revealed mild hypoxemia on room air and diffuse fine bibasal and spiritual crepes. Moreover, lymph nodes were enlarged and there was mild splenomegaly and hepatomegaly. He is an only child and there is no history of recurrent infections from parents or close relatives. Initial investigations revealed lymphocytopenia, thrombocytopenia and a decreased gamma fraction on serum protein electrophoresis. A sputum sample was also positive for Haemophilus influenza. Chest x-ray showed bilateral patchy zones and nodular opacities in the basal region of both lungs. Pulmonary function tests revealed a reduced diffusion capacity of the lungs for carbon monoxide, known as DLCO. CT thorax demonstrated diffuse nodules, lymphadenopathy, reticulation and ground glass opacities, while abdominal imaging confirmed inguinal lymphadenopathy and mild hepatosplenomegaly. Bronchiolar lavage was negative for bacteria and viruses. However, cellular analysis did show lymphocytosis. Initial immunological investigations showed low levels of IgG. IgA and IgM were absent. Serum levels of specific IgE to unconjugated pneumococcal vaccine were low, despite previous immunization. CD19 positive cell counts and T cell subsets were within normal range, although some patients with CVID do have low naive T cells. A more specific peripheral B cell panel showed a severe reduction in switch memory B cells and an expansion of CD21 low B cells. Patients with CVID are sometimes classified according to their B cell phenotype. What are the diagnoses to consider for this patient? This young man suffered from recurrent bacterial infections since his teenage years and had low immunoglobulins. His clinical picture also included autoimmune thrombocytopenia. The history of bacterial infections suggests a possible defect in humoral immunity. Among primary antibody defects, the age of onset, i.e. greater than three years of age in this patient, ruled out a diagnosis of transient hypogammaglobulinemia of infancy. And the normal amount of peripheral B cells makes excellent A gamma globulinemia or receptive forms of this disease unlikely. Isolated IgG subclass defect was excluded by the fact that both IgA and IgM were also absent. Clinical and immunological features were consistent with the diagnosis of CVID. CVID is defined as a marked decrease in serum IgG, i.e two standard deviations below the normal, with a decrease in IgA and or IgM, a poor antibody response to unconjugated vaccines, and the exclusion of secondary causes of hypogammaglobinemia. The age of onset is variable, and diagnosis is often delayed due to poor understanding of the condition. Although patients with CVID share many clinical and immunological features, the severity and degree of the disease varies considerably between affected individuals.
The most consistent clinical feature is increased susceptibility to respiratory tract infections. But at least one third of patients also develop autoimmunity, lymphoproliferation and malignancies. CVID is a diagnosis of exclusion. Therefore, other causes of hypogammaglobulinemia must be ruled out, like secondary failures of immunoglobulin production in the context of lymphoid malignancies, infections, or due to certain medications, including B-cell depleting agents like rituximab or even chronic steroid use. Low immunoglobulin level can be secondary to immunoglobulin loss in protein losing enteropathies or severe proteinuria. Lymphoid malignancies must be excluded in these patients especially given the high prevalence of reactive lymph nodes. If normal lymphoproliferation is suspected, a biopsy for histological evaluation is warranted. Given the nodular lesions in our patient, a CT-guided lung biopsy was performed to rule out pulmonary lymphoma. Malignancy was not detected. Findings were consistent with lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. Baseline laboratory workup for these patients also includes exclusion of HIV as well as CMV and EBV PCR testing. Lab tests assessing for proteinuria and serum albumin levels were not consistent with immunoglobulin loss in our patient, nor were clinical symptoms. However, exclusion of enteral loss can be very difficult. A diagnosis of CVID is confirmed by assessing vaccine responses in all but those with very low immunoglobulins or undetectable IgG, or in the cases where testing antibody levels pre and four weeks post vaccination may delay therapy and could be deleterious to the patient's health. In clinical practice, pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccines are the most commonly used to evaluate T cell independent responses, while diphtheria and tetanus toxoid vaccines are used to assess T cell dependent responses. In our patient, we first measured serum levels of specific IgG to anti-pneumococcal antibodies. In the initial measurement, specific IgG titers were low. Therefore, we immunized the patient and repeated the measurement after four weeks. Specific pneumococcal antibodies did not rise to protective titers post-immunization. This is consistent with a diagnosis of CVID. Genetic studies are desirable in these patients, but are not required to confirm the diagnosis. The immune defects common to most CBID patients is a loss of memory or effector function of B cells, which leads to dysfunctional antibody production. The defect can be intrinsic to B cells or due to insufficient help from other cells. In general, nearly all patients have a decreased number of switched memory B cells and plasma cells. Most CVID cases are thought to be sporadic. However, familial cases have been reported and are mainly associated with an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance often with variable penetrance. A monogenetic defect is identified in around 20% of patients. However, this may rise with increased interest and access to genetic testing. Genes identified as monogenetic causes of CVID are classified as B-cell survival defects, activation defects, class switch recombination defects, or poor terminal differentiation of memory cells or plasma cells. Increased access to next-generation genetic sequencing has allowed the identification of more pathogenic gene variants in these patients. To date, there are no clinical guidelines for genetic workup for CVID patients. However, genetic assessment should be considered in patients with clinical signs of immune dysregulation, early disease onset, or a positive family history. As a consequence of the immunological defects, individuals with CVID may present with recurrent infections, affecting different systems, especially the upper and lower respiratory tract. Recurrent otitis media, sinusitis and pneumonia are the most frequent manifestations prior to diagnosis. The incidence of respiratory infections is generally reduced once immunoglobulin replacement therapy is instigated. In addition, GI infections are common at presentation and after diagnosis. Other complications such as septic arthritis, meningitis and sepsis have been reported. Infections are usually caused by encapsulated bacteria. These microorganisms require opsonization by antibodies as a primary host defense. Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza and mycoplasma account for the majority of respiratory infections. Rhinovirus is a common cause of rhinosinusitis. Acute diarrhea in patients with CVID is often due to Giardia, norovirus, or Compilobacter jejuni. 
Unusual or opportunistic infections with viral or other fungal pathogens are uncommon in these patients. Of note, about one third of patients are described as having an infection only manifestation of CVID. Most others have other autoimmune or other complications. In addition to infection, immune dysregulation can lead to autoimmunity, lymphoproliferation, malignancy and inflammatory conditions usually involving the GI or pulmonary system. Autoimmune conditions are present in almost one third of CVID patients and can be the initial manifestation. Autoimmune cytopenias are most common. Non-infectious GI disease is identified in up to one in five patients. Malabsorption and weight loss as well as deficiencies have been described. Patients with CVID may also develop non-caseating granulomas in lymphoid tissue or solid organs, including the lung, lymph nodes, liver, intestine, brain or skin. Common manifestations include lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly or pulmonary symptoms mimicking a sarcoid-like disorder. GLILD stands for granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease and can occur in these patients. Chronic lung disease is a common problem leading to recurrent hospitalizations and significant morbidity and mortality. Approximately one third of patients have chronic lung disease by the time of diagnosis. Lung function tests are not sensitive enough to duly differentiate between bronchiectasis and secondary fibrosis due to GLILD. Therefore, CT scanning is essential. Splenomegaly and lymphadenopathy are common in CVID patients, although the pathogenesis of these findings is not often known. Liver dysfunction has also been described in approximately 1 in 10 patients. Thus, liver enzyme monitoring is important. Finally, the increased risk of malignancy has been documented, particularly non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as well as gastric cancers. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are often extranodal and of B-cell origin. The prevalence varies amongst different cohorts. Once a diagnosis of CVID has been made, what are the treatment options? Immunoglobulin replacement therapy is the cornerstone of treatment. Polyvalent human immunoglobulins are administered to patients with CVID by intravenous or subcutaneous routes. Usually there's a monthly cumulative dose of 400 to 600 milligrams per kilogram. The interval of administration varies according to the route of application. Immunoglobulin replacement therapy reduces the incidence of severe pulmonary or systemic infections and can help prevent development of long-term pulmonary damage, but does not cure the biological defect in CVID. It is important to mention that GI infections and non-infectious complications are relatively unaffected by immunoglobulin therapy. Moreover, immunoglobulin replacement is not known to alter the development of malignancy or impact on granulomatous disease. Antibiotic therapy is indicated for any suspected or documented inf bacterial infection to reduce the length and severity of the disease. In some instances, prolonged or intravenous antibiotic therapy is necessary, or indeed, some patients are on prophylactic therapy long term. For autoimmune cytopenias, glucocorticoids have traditionally been used as first line therapy. However, rituximab has been used successfully and should be considered in patients with recurrent episodes that are refractory to glucocorticoid use. Anti-inflammatory or other immunomodulatory therapies have also been used for the treatment of granulomatous disease. However, there are no standard treatment protocols and clinical response is variable. In recent times, hemopoietic stem cell transplant is being considered in some cases of CVID, especially when the genetic defect is known. Pros and cons of this is beyond the scope of our talk today. Furthermore, there are studies involving gene therapy that could be curative to those with a known monogenetic cause. Thus far, these have mostly been tested in rodent models. In conclusion, we can summarize that CVID is a heterogeneous primary humoral deficiency associated with impaired memory and effector B cell function. Clinical symptoms can appear at any time, but most frequently present between the second and third decades of life.
Patients are divided on the basis of their clinical presentation into infection only, typically presenting with recurrent respiratory tract infections by encapsulated bacteria, or patients with a more complex disease, including autoimmunity, lymphoproliferation, granulomatous inflammation, or malignancy. Life-threatening complications can be due to chronic lung disease, bronchiectasis or GLILD, or chronic anthropathy with malabsorption, liver dysfunction, or lymphomas. The pathogenesis of this disease is poorly understood, with monogenetic defects currently only recorded in about 20% of patients. To diagnose CVID, the patient must be over four years of age, have a markedly low IgG, two standard deviations below normal, and or low IgA and IgM. An impaired vaccine response is also desirable for diagnosis. Furthermore, secondary causes of low immunoglobulins should be excluded. Immunoglobulin replacement therapy is the cornerstone of therapy for CVID, together with prompt antibiotic treatment for infections. Management of non-infectious complications is challenging and can include immunosuppressive agents. In recent times, patients can sometimes be classified according to their B or T cell phenotype. Thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoyed this video.